Welcome to Go Vote Omaha, presented by the League of Women Voters of Greater Omaha. I'm Jerry Simon, a League member and your host. Each program we talk about important public policy issues. We hope you'll discuss the same issues and that at election time you'll be ready and willing to go vote. This program we are going to discuss what our guest has called LGBTQ 101 or putting the puzzle pieces together. And to, to join the discussion or lead our discussion, our guest is Joni Stacy. She's a family law attorney in private practice in Omaha. And welcome, Joni. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Great. Well, first, let's just briefly talk about there, in our society, there has been discrimination against the LGBTQ community. Um, where does that come from? And, and a lot of hate. We've had things like bathroom bills come up and re, re talking about gay marriage debate, religious exceptions, condoning discrimination. We have. It's been busy. <laughs> <laughs> So I would say that what I find in doing these trainings and talking to families and talking to the general public is that most of it is rooted in a lack of education, in a true misunderstanding about what it is to be LGBTQ, who those people are, mm -hmm. and how our opinions of them have been oftentimes um, jaded or formed by stereotypes that aren't necessarily true about the community. And that that lack of information or lack of education sometimes then manifests itself in fear in people. And then that's the part of the, the side of folks that isn't very attractive. And okay. that's the part that we see. So let's get right into putting the puzzle pieces together, as okay. you call it, um, and talking about terminology. And we have a slide, um, our first slide we're going to throw up on the screen as you talk. So talk about the, the terminology that we need to begin understanding. Sure. So this is where I start uh, every conversation that I have with folks, uh, particularly if I have a PowerPoint handy. <laughs> but I start it in talking about the components that make up our sexuality, because if we don't understand those components, then it's real difficult for us to have a further in-depth conversation about it. And so one of the reasons that it's referred to as LGBTQ 101 is that it really is the basics. This is a really complex topic, far more than we could cover in this mm -hmm. half an hour or even in a, probably a three-day seminar. So the basics are that we start out certainly first with our biology, and that's the makeup of our anatomy, chromosomes, and hormones. And most folks, particularly in Western society, think of it as a binary concept, meaning there's exactly two options. We look between a baby's legs when they're born, we assign them male or female, and that everybody fits into one of those two neat little categories. And in reality, there are folks that fall somewhere along the continuum that have some combination of both either anatomy, chromosomes, and or hormones, and are said to have intersex conditions. And so I think the main part of um, learning about sexuality is understanding that it, all of these exist on a continuum and that there aren't two little packages for each category. And that's how we typically think about these things. Uh, the second component then is gender identity, and that is a person's internal sense of self or what their brain tells them they are. Okay. And most again, most folks think of it as a binary concept. There's exactly two options. You either identify as a man or a woman. Mm -hmm. But there are lots of folks for whom those two boxes don't fit, and they would fall somewhere along the continuum. So on the slide is just a few of those identities. Certainly not exhaustive. There are lots of ways that folks describe their lived experience. And so Two-Spirit would borrow from the Native American or the indigenous culture, and they were actually very revered in their tribes because they had a unique worldview. They had the anatomy of one sex and the gender of another in their brain, and so they were often the mentors and the healers in those tribes. And then we hear terms like third gender or non-binary, and those are folks that just don't feel like the categories or the labels of man and woman fit for them. And then there are folks that are gender fluid and they feel like they're a little bit of both and that they float or are fluid between the two genders that we have in our society. Then folks that identify as agender really feel like none of those boxes fit them and that they are without a gender. So pretty tough spot to be in when you're yeah. filling out forms or picking a restroom right. or anything else that we do on a regular basis where we have two options to choose from. Okay. So do we have any idea how many what percent of the population um, fits more somewhere on the continuum rather than one of the you know, male, female? We don't have exact numbers. We have a little bit better numbers uh, or ranges for folks with intersex conditions because there is typically a medical intervention for those, although that's not exhaustive either because there are intersex conditions that are 
we'll say mild enough that somebody may or may not seek medical attention for it, but there really isn't any governmental agency that collects that information, and all vital records, birth and death records in all 50 states have exactly two boxes. Mm -hmm. So we can't gain the information there either. And so it typically comes from surveying and self-reporting, and so that's a little skewed. Um, certainly over the years, it's been very um, unpopular to identify as LGBTQ, and so lots of folks haven't. Mm -hmm. So I think as time goes on and people are more open about living authentically, that we'll see those numbers more specifically. So right now, it can really range in terms of transgender folks, anywhere between less than 1% to 3%. And then when we look at the whole LGBTQ umbrella together, mm -hmm. oftentimes roughly 10% is thrown out okay. as a portion of the population. Okay. Um, then what you, the one thing we wanted to talk about now too is um, to getting to talk about the difference between gender expression and gender um, identity. Sure. So, so the difference there is when you talk about your gender expression, that's how we communicate our gender to the world. And so we do it in really obvious ways, like with clothing and hairstyles mm -hmm. and presence and absence of facial hair or makeup, but we do it in more subtle ways too. Our tone and pitch of voice, our gait, tattoos, piercings, all of those things collectively communicate our gender. And so this one seems to be the spectrum that people have the easiest time appreciating not being just two boxes. Mm -hmm. Because most folks, they, they know someone if they aren't themselves somewhere along that continuum. So the androgynous term is, or gender neutral is for someone who presents in such a way that you don't know if they're male or female just by looking at them. Mm -hmm. And so that's probably less common than most, and most people would fall somewhere between masculine and gender neutral or feminine and gender neutral and find their comfort zone there. Okay. Um, well, then we have our second slide that we wanted to throw up there. and. Um, this talks, um, this slide has, um, you're talking about culture and biology based. Yes. So yes. talk a little bit more about that. Sure. So when we look at all three continuums, we are biologically, ba they're biologically based. So we don't have any say in the sex that we're assigned at birth. We don't have anything to say about what our brain tells us in terms of our gender identity. Mm -hmm. And we don't have anything to say about our gender expression in terms of where we're most comfortable. Certainly we can get outside of that box. I can get dressed up when I'm forced to <laughs> and spend more than two minutes on my makeup if I have to. Um, but where I'm most comfortable kind of comes hardwired. But what's unique about gender expression is that it's culturally based as well, meaning that we as a society have some say about what it is to be masculine and feminine and that those definitions or those stereotypes change over time. So there was a time where you and I wouldn't be wearing pants and a jacket today. That mm -hmm. would have been scandalous and cross-dressing, you know, considered yes. cross-dressing, and certainly not today. Um, and so we have to think about that, that, that they're not hard and fast rules, that there is room for folks um, to make a little more room for gender expression if we just uh, allow ourselves to break down those stereotypes and mm -hmm. then to consider what history dictated that thank goodness doesn't dictate anymore because I, I like wearing pants. I do too. <laughs> and I don't like pantyhose. Okay. So I'm glad that those days are, those day, forced days are over as well. Right. And that's a choice though for people it too. Is. They still want to wear it. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, I'm just glad I have it, the choice. So, so we've got identity, expression, but now throw sexual orientation into the mix. Yes. How does and that's that term fit in? Completely different. Um, spectrum, also a part of our sexuality, but very different from your gender identity um, and your biology, and that is your physical and romantic attraction to other folks. Um, whether or not you have it at all, um, if you aren't attracted to, to any genders, then that you'd be considered asexual. Um, and then certainly most folks understand uh, what it is to be straight, and most folks understand what it is to be gay. But it's the other identities that sometimes um, are more confusing for folks. So there's pansexual, and that's being really attracted to all identities. So they wouldn't, um, it, is, it doesn't matter if you're male or female, it doesn't matter if you're transgender or you have an intersex condition. For someone who's pansexual, they're really looking for that soulmate. And the best way I've heard that described is that it's hearts, not parts. Um, okay. <laughs> and so that's, there's a, a whole continuum in terms of sexual orientation as well that's very different from your gender identity and your biology. Okay. Anything else that you want to say about those first two, information those first two slides at this point? I don't think so. Okay, Thank great. You. All right. Well, you mentioned transgender 
people. Yes. Um, and so do you want to talk and explain what does that mean? What does that term mean? What does it mean to be transgender? Sure. So first we'll start with what it means to not be transgender, okay. and that is that that term is cisgender. So if you're cisgender, it means the sex you were assigned at birth and your gender identity or what's going on in your brain match. So I was assigned female at birth and my gender identity is a woman, mm -hmm. so I'm cisgender. And if you're transgender, it can both be an umbrella term and it can be a specific term about someone whose biology or the sex they were assigned at birth doesn't match their gender identity. And so that specific term is called transgender and we might hear different terms about um, trans man or trans woman associated with somebody who's transitioning mm -hmm. so that their gender identity, their body matches their gender identity. And it differs from the sex they were assigned at birth. As an umbrella term, it encompasses anybody whose either gender identity or gender expression don't match the sex they were assigned at birth. Okay. So let's talk a little bit more about, and we have a slide about the um, transgender umbrella that you described. Sure. Um, tell more about what it is and help us understand the terms that, that sure. go under that umbrella. Sure. So some of the terms, and this again is not an exhaustive list and it's changing all the time. So mm -hmm. it's a really um, kind of fun and exciting topic to research and study because it's ever changing. So it's never stagnant. So some of the terms relating to somebody's gender identity would be transgender, you'd hear trans man, uh, trans woman, you might hear F to M or M to F, and that has to do with somebody who's transitioning. Transsexual is also a term that's sometimes used, it's a little, um, uh, little outdated, not that somebody can't self-identify that way, it's just mm -hmm. used a little bit less, and I think it's because it's got that three-letter word sex in it, and it gets people thinking about somebody's orientation that has nothing to do with their gender identity. So it kind of gets people derailed in the conversation, so I mm -hmm. think that's some of the resistance to use that word. And um, then you also would have gender fluid, and that's again, somebody who feels like they really are both genders, and so that they're fluid in between. And then again, someone who identifies as a gender or feeling mm -hmm. like they don't match the sex they were assigned at birth, mm -hmm. They don't match any other one either. They're under that umbrella as well relating to their gender identity. Okay. And then um, again, you have more, some other terms relating to gender expression. Um, yes. Talk about those. There's sure. some that are. Sure, so uh, we hear kind of a more clinical term is gender nonconforming or gender variant when we're talking about youth. And I prefer the terms gender creative or gender independent. We also hear gender expansive more and more because it's really when we're talking about kids and we're talking about smaller children, it's really what toys are they playing with and mm -hmm. what kind of expression they have. And it's not necessarily related to their gender identity. So um, uh, a child that was assigned male at birth that starts playing with a Barbie doll, we don't need to start wondering if they're transgender. It's just a toy. Mm -hmm. And so at that point, it's just your gender expression. It's just how you're expressing your gender, but not necessarily related to your gender identity. So the same thing with someone who identifies as a cross-dresser, that has to do with their gender expression or how they're communicating their gender to the world, but it doesn't have any, it does not making any statement about their gender identity. Drag kings and drag queens mm -hmm. are those who cross-dress and they do it for entertainment reasons. Okay, and when you're talking about cross-dressing too, that doesn't necessarily speak to sexual orientation? It does not, it, okay. it does not. And that's a common, um, common misconception is that all cross-dressers um, are either gay men or that they're transgender people who haven't transitioned yet. Mm -hmm. And that is not true. If you're truly a cross-dresser, then it has to do with your gender expression mm -hmm. and it does not have to do with your gender identity or your sexual orientation. Okay. Most okay. cross-dressers um, are straight men. Okay. So these are things that are that are confusing to people and, sure. and can be difficult to understand. You they know, are the terminology. Um, okay, so we have all these terms rather <laughs> explained, and, and, and hopefully we under, we're understanding them. And we have a, um, another um, slide that's uh, what do we do with all the terms? How right. do we what are, what are the important things that need to be remembered by people? Sure. So I think the first and foremost in, in my heart is that the term is not transgendered with an ED on the end. Uh -huh. This has not happened to them. It's an adjective, so it's a transgender person, a transgender woman, um, but it hasn't happened to them. They haven't been transgendered. So I oftentimes will say, I haven't been straightened and my gay friends haven't been gayed, <laughs> and they have not been transgendered. So that's a really important one. And the other one is in describing, <coughs> excuse me, that people transition. 
So we'll hear terms like transing or transgendering. The term is transitioning, and it's difficult because it sounds a lot like transgender, so people kind of struggle with that in the beginning. So it's just a term that people need to learn. And those can kind of morph into a derogatory terms too, they right? Can. They can, okay. absolutely. So you want to be careful about what language, be yes. very specific about yes, language use. Yes, exactly. Okay. Okay, so other important things to remember. So the next um, two are pretty similar, just that making sure that people draw the distinction that transgender or your gender identity um, doesn't mean that you're intersex necessarily. Not all, they're not interchangeable terms. So there are oftentimes people who are intersex and they never identify as transgender, and some do, some small number of intersex folks do but they're not interchangeable. And the same thing with being transgender or your gender identity is not an interchangeable term with your orientation. Okay. And then um, another couple things that are on there is our queer and questioning. Talk about that. Those are delicate ones. So yeah. <laughs> queer in particular, if you're over the age of about 35, makes the hair on the back of your neck stand up. Uh -huh. So one of the things that we talk about in terms of queer is explaining the difference today than yes. what it was 30 years ago. So 30 so years ago, It was that a term. very, always a derogatory term. Yes. Um, I would say invariably a derogatory term. So now it still can be. However, it's also a really positive term for especially youth. And so there are youth that are identifying as queer for a couple of reasons. One is that um, we have a lot of stereotypes. We have a stereotype about what a straight girl looks like and acts mm -hmm. like. And we have a stereotype about what it is to be a lesbian girl. And we have a stereotype about what it is to be a gay boy. And so if somebody comes out and they're, you know, say 18 to 20, then they don't want you to just put them in another stereotypical box. You know, not every lesbian is like Ellen DeGeneres. And not every gay guy is Jack from Will and Grace. As awesome as both of those two people are, they don't represent the gay community for the entire world. And so I think it's a, it's a resistance to those boxes. And the other issue is what happens if somebody is, um, has an intersex condition and presents androgynously and is pansexual. That might take about 20 minutes during every introduction to explain who you are and, and yeah, and what your orientation and gender yes. identity are. Yes. And so if you identify as queer, it kind of serves as an umbrella term that, that okay. um, encompasses lots of different identities without having to explain yourself every time you turn around. Okay. And one thing you have on here that I think is important, um, well, it is, it's your list of important things. Um, <laughs> the average age of realizing um, your identity, your orientation, sure. it's different for everybody. It is, it's different for everybody and it's also different among the two. So that all the current research says on average, we know our orientation at about 10 years old. But the American Academy of Pediatrics says we have a firm sense of our gender between the ages of two and five. So there is a big difference about when someone knows about their gender identity and when they know about their orientation. And oftentimes people think that happens at exactly the same time. Mm -hmm. And so if any of those conversations happen before about middle school, people start to panic. And there really are two different things and two different okay. realizations that you have about yourself. And I would ask anybody who's watching this, when did you, you know, decide or figure out your gender? It is kind of an innate thing that's pretty early mm -hmm. memory and recollection of who you are. Right. And um, one of the other important things that you mentioned, again, because you're talking about a continuum, is the human condition is not binary, so explain that. Sure. Yeah. So when we think about everything that makes us up as humans, so we have hair color, eye color, body shape, weight, all of those things, are there only two options? You know, do you either have hair or you don't have hair, or is there thinning hair? <laughs> Is everybody a blonde or brunette? No. Does everybody have you know, green or brown eyes? No. And so when we talk about scientifically our human condition, does it seem to make much sense that when it comes to orientation and gender identity, we say there's just two and pick one? Mm -hmm. Everything about us exists on a continuum. And so our gender identity and orientation really aren't any different. I think that's a difficult concept for a lot of people, though, because there's, it's so ingrained in saying you've got those two boxes sure. only. It is, so. it is difficult, and I think some of that is just understanding the science behind it. And if you start at the biology part, where we understand that, no, it isn't just a man or a woman, that there really are folks that are born with intersex conditions, then I think the rest of it seems a little easier to understand and learn about. Okay. 
And do you think, uh, I, I would think that in terms of our culture, as more and more people are open about talking about the continuum, recognizing who they are, or, or, ex, or you know, stating who they are, that that makes a difference for people too. It's, it's a it's huge part of the difference. Education. When you see yourself in the world, when you think about in the 60s, there wouldn't have been any examples or role models of a gay person on television, or in politics, or mm -hmm. you know, at your school. And so how do you see yourself, if you're a gay kiddo, how do you see yourself as an adult if you don't see yourself in any of the role models that are in your life? Those are the closet years. Right, so. right. And so hopefully the more and more people that are living their authentic selves, it gives more people permission to do so. And they'll have support, the support that they need to be themselves. Because that's when we're most productive, is when we get to be ourselves. And your, your one uh, list of things, remember, we, do, we know better when we do better, if yeah. we know better. Right. So. And some yes, of the sir. comparisons I, I talk about in, in that portion when we have a little more time is, is what we did with left-handed kids for generations before we knew that handedness was, again, just a difference in human condition. And what did we do with all those kiddos that had learning differences for a long time before we knew what they were? And we're still not great at it, but we're much better than we used to be. And now we listen to what they say about how they learn, and we mm -hmm. find that we can teach better if we listen to them. So we thought back then our people were considered evil or suspect because Absolutely. they were left-handed mm -hmm. or Absolutely. learned in a different way. Or just lazy so, and stubborn and right. you know, weren't cooperating with you know, right. the, the civilized society. And that was so the case that at leads all. to anger and fear about <laughs> <laughs> that, that exactly. person. So, okay. Um, well, one thing I wanted to talk about was, um, and maybe you can, you can talk a little bit more about this in terms of, of uh, you know, we talk about left-handed and how people are viewed. What's the best way to be respectful towards people? I mean, some people do start out, you mentioned the androgynous person, yes. where I might not know. Right. Um, so they might introduce themselves and say, my pronouns are, or they might not. So what's right. the best way to be respectful? And you do you need to know? Is it okay to ask? I think that you can ask if there is some reason that you would need to know. And I would say that if you're having a long conversation with somebody, you should try it sometime. It's really difficult to only use someone's name. <laughs> in particular, yes. if, the, if you're talking about them to someone else or you're referring to a student or a colleague or a family member, it's really difficult to not use a pronoun. So sometimes it's appropriate to ask and sometimes it's appropriate if it's just going to be a short interaction with somebody, maybe you don't need to know. Maybe yeah. that's okay. That's, yeah. That would, be, that would be the thing that's, I think most people, it's like, just ask. A person right. is going to, um, I would think, most of the time is not going to be offended by your asking. They're going to say, you're being considerate. Right. That you what want to pronouns know. do you use? Right. Exactly. Okay. And then please use them. <laughs> yeah. Yes. That's, that's the, the follow-up to that. That's the follow-up to that. <laughs> um, well, what can our, our viewers do now to promote acceptance and un more understanding? Well, I think some of the things they can do, in the, even in their own household, is just start having conversations. Um, a lot of times families will talk about how can I start these conversations with my kiddos if I don't think they're part of the LGBTQ community but I just want them to be open and understand mm -hmm. it about uh, all of the other people that they're going to encounter in their lives. And I always say talk about it in terms of when it comes up on TV. Uh, talk about marriage equality when you see that it's coming across the screen and uh, the Supreme Court decides a decision about it. Uh, talk about it. Talk about it at the dinner table, that's okay. Talk about your friends that are LGBTQ and incorporate them as part of your, part of your life. And then we're all on social media a lot. Mm -hmm. You can like the things that are supportive of the LGBTQ community and that sends signals to other people in your lives that you're a safe person or that you are open to learning. And ask questions. If something mm -hmm. happens on social media and you're confused by it or you don't know, be open. We don't, I think one of the things that we do too in social media now or just internet in general, is that we assume that we have to have an opinion about every topic that comes across <laughs> our feed. And it, it, it isn't always the case, no. and that needs to be okay. It needs to be okay that we just ask questions and sit back and learn rather than making assumptions. Okay. And we're doing better in this country. Absolutely. I think we are. <laughs> um, what, are there any other countries that are good models of what co that we can learn from in terms of just countries sure. that have that are doing better? Sure, than this country is. Done? Yeah, there's about a half a dozen countries right now that are um, that have legally incorporated a third gender 
in terms of their legal documents. So we have Australia and New Zealand and Balta and Pakistan and Nepal and Canada is in the process of doing that okay. as well. So I think there's some of those some of those examples and certainly marriage equality is swathing its way across the globe. So okay. yeah, there, it's happening think, other places as well. Oregon has had, I think they just passed having a they third did. box. They okay. did, and I think California's in the works for that as well. So we are coming along. Okay, and Nebraska might be a little further. <laughs> <away>. <laughs> might. <laughs> okay, starts at the coast <laughs> and, and moved in. Um, one thing that I wanted to briefly talk about, we have just a couple minutes left, is discrimination. If you see it or suspect it, what should you do? I think speak up, and I think there's a couple of different things that ways that that manifests itself. Some is you're literally witnessing it, um, and I think then you have to make a, a safety determination first. Are you safe to step in? Um, and then secondly, it, their water cooler jokes and email forwards. So I think certainly the water cooler jokes, um, if you can call them jokes, and the email forwards, those can be addressed a little more easily. They typically come from someone you know and that you have mm -hmm. a rapport with and you're safe. So you can say that you don't appreciate that and stop that where it is, and I think that's an important voice. If you feel in a personal situation where you need to be, unfortunately, a bystander because of safety issue, you can at least be of a support once it's over. Mm -hmm. um, so that you go to the, not to the aggressor, but to the, to the other person um, and, and comfort them and make sure that they're safe and that they get, they get the help that they need. Because I think safety's first. You can't help anybody if you're not safe. So right. you don't want anybody in a dangerous situation. But if you're in a position of power where you can speak up, then please do. So you can show you're an ally by approaching a person Absolutely. or persons that who've been mistreated. And sometimes so. people will just get in between the person and the aggressor so that there's a physical barrier, even if you're not saying anything. And even if that's the most you can do, that's helpful to stop the, the train of conversation. Is it helpful to notify law enforcement if needed? It can be, absolutely. Okay. Okay, or any position of authority if you're in a school setting or something like that, absolutely. Or if you're in an employment situation, HR, that's what they're there for. Okay. Well, Joni, this has gone, our program's gone by very quickly and we've <laughs> covered a lot of information. Um, hopeful that people have gotten a good idea of um, putting the puzzle pieces together. Thank you I for being so our too. guest. Thank you for having me. For the League of Women Voters, I'm Jerry Simon reminding you to inform yourself about the issues and at election time, go vote, Omaha.